Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. April, in case you didn't know, is National Hope Month. And here to talk about hope and all that it entails is our guest this morning, Dr. Roslyn Tompkins. She is a hopeologist and she's also the author of As Long As There Is Breath In Your Body, There Is Still Hope. Dr. Tompkins, good morning and welcome. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, so before we start talking about hope, Tell us a little bit about you and your journey. Well, my journey just to hope, and as, as I write about in As Long As There's Breath in Your Body, Still Hope, started when I was 12 years old, and I began to smoke marijuana, and it progressed into a full-blown uh, addiction to crack cocaine before it was all over with, and, uh, and then I finally was able to find this hope that I talk about in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I've been walking free and clean mm. for 34 years and counting. Wow. Take me back, Dr. Tompkins. Take us all back to your 12-year-old self when you first hit marijuana. And how did that happen? I had an older brother, uh, three years older than, than me, and we used to, to go outside in the backyard. I grew up in North Florida and uh, played basketball on a tree. We had a ring on the tree and we would go and, and I loved doing that. That was my way of bonding with him. And, you know, after school, mm -hmm. before my mom got off work. And one day it was a little different because I came out to play basketball and he called me over behind the tree and he said, here, take a hit of this. And uh, and so being my older brother, I, I did it. And to tell you the truth, at first, I didn't like the way I felt. Uh, but he also introduced it to my two cousins who were around my age. And so then I started feeling left out. And then so we just all started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so when did when did you start using it to numb whatever it was that you didn't want to feel? Do you remember? Well, it became such a part, you know, that was back in the 70s mm -hmm. and, and going into the 80s. So it was a lot of drug use taking place then. But I really believe that uh, it became such a norm for me until, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't high, I didn't feel normal. Mm -hmm. And when did it, when did you cross over into crack? When it hit the streets. Because at 17 years old, I, by the grace of God, I was able to graduate high school and I came down to Tallahassee to attend Florida State University. And I was still, as we called it, partying. And so I was smoking marijuana. We were doing some freebasing then. And then all of a sudden, this crack cocaine hit the street and someone introduced it. Mm -hmm. And I was there to meet it. Hmm. And I knew from the very first hit that it was it was demonic and it, it was something that was not to be played with actually do you think you were addicted after the first hit i believe that i could have been uh addicted after the first hit i decided i think i only experimented with crack for about six months mm -hmm. and then i decided that it was too much for me but i didn't stop using altogether i still smoked marijuana and snorted cocaine and until life began to catch up with me and I ended up uh, losing a, a baby that I carried for six months mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden I realized you know what this this is real I, I you know this is too much what's what's going on and uh, by the time two years later when I got pregnant with my daughter Janar who is now 33 and I have 34 years mm -hmm. that was it and I was like, okay, Lord, I surrender, mm -hmm. you know, help me and whatever you want me to do, I'll, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. But I just need to get off this. And in the book, you write about the mental breaks that you had, the psychotic breaks that you had. And yeah. I think that that's so critically important for the purpose of this conversation, because oftentimes people don't really deal with psychotic breaks until they start to experience drugs that, that change the, the brain's chemistry. 
Yes. Yes. And, and I believe, you know, I believe it was definitely drug induced psychosis, uh, back in, you know, we, if we go back to my teenage, uh, when I was in college early, uh, 19, probably about 19 years old, I started drinking, uh, mushroom tea. I, you know, I, I experimented with it one summer and it was called shrooning. Now it's coming back and people are, are looking at it like, oh, this, this incredible thing that can help you to really get in touch with, you know, yourself and learn things. But no, it's, mm-hmm. it's like LSD. And I started uh, drinking that one summer and it caused me to have several psychotic breaks with reality that were just devastating. Mm. You know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Mm-hmm. It was something that I believe that I had to go through on my journey to finally get me to this place that I am today. Mm-hmm. And when you were going through those psychotic breaks, your family was there. How do they begin to speak to you about making the turn and stopping? Because you do stop some, but, but not all, you know, at that time you'd stop some, Mm -hmm. but not everything. Yes. Well, you know, I always talk about my mother and, uh, you know, may she rest in peace. Um, she always was there for me. She always prayed for me. Mm -hmm. Um, she never gave up on me and it was just something about that type of unconditional love that, that kept drawing me. It it kept drawing me to that place where, um, inside of me, I knew that I was more than the circumstances and I was more than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things about hope. And I'm so excited about Now that Mothers in Crisis is focusing on the National Month of Hope and this whole hope campaign, Mm -hmm. because hope is a powerful force. And when my family, other family members had given up on me and they said, well, you know, she's never going to change. It's never going to, you know, turn around. My mother never gave up hope. Mm. Wow. So how do we help people who feel hopeless like your family did when you were going through addiction? Well, that's, that's a wonderful question because um, that's one of the things that we're excited about with the whole hope campaign is that we've come up with strategies and ways that you can, first of all, become more hopeful yourself to begin to think hope because it is a process of training your brain uh, to to move from that place of negativity where you just look at things as they are, mm-hmm. but you can begin to look at things and determine uh, through the eyes of faith, possibilities, imagining hope of what they could be. And then also we talk about how to make hope connections, how you can actually now that you become more hopeful you can begin to spread this hope by having hope chats with others. And see, a hope chat is simply a way to engage with someone where you connect with your heart and not your head. Mm -hmm. And you let them know that you care about them, you're checking up on them, and you want to be there for them. And I'm telling you, I have seen over the years through Mothers in Crisis, thousands of women that I've worked with, especially during the height of the crack cocaine, epidemic and every one of them was looking for love and looking for someone that could look in their eyes and see them Mm -hmm. and I could see them because as I was looking at them I was looking at myself but for the grace of God Mm -hmm. and so because of that connection now that real unconditional love connection I could bring hope and say well you know I've been where you are and I made it out and so can you. And it's just like a little spark just just shines like in the midst of that for them to think about, you know, maybe I can. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can. And so you understand addiction in a real intrinsic way. What was what was that final straw for you when you said, "Okay, I'm done? My my daughter, uh, when I got pregnant with her. 
And that's sort of like the catalyst for Mothers in Crisis, because I know that's a that's a powerful event, not not for everyone, because I, like I said, I've worked with thousands and it doesn't always work like that. But for me, and especially since I had lost one child, one daughter uh, because of my addiction, whenever I became pregnant with my daughter, Janar, something inside of me, that was the hope inside of me mm -hmm. that, you know what, you got to get yourself together. You know, you can do this and 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 begin to uh, go back to my to my roots of what I was taught to call on Jesus, pray, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever it's going to take now. Mm -hmm. She was my catalyst. She was my baby of hope. Wow. One of the things that you talk about was how demonic it felt. And you write in the book that you, you felt like you couldn't you couldn't even differentiate your body parts like you felt like you had been possessed by a demonic spirit. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's exactly, I felt like I had left my body and some monster had, had, had entered. And, and uh, for me, as a, as a woman of faith, I, I know that it is a demonic, there's a demonic dimension mm -hmm. to this addiction and that I was definitely under that, bondage and stronghold for for many years because I wanted to stop and I didn't want to go through especially the pain and the shame and you know the humiliation but I couldn't so it had that spiritual component to it and it wasn't until I surrendered all to the Lord that I was able to break free surrendering for most people is really the hardest part what was the surrender like for you the brokenness. And finally, because I look at myself prior to and whenever I started, you know, using and, and, and all of my young adult life, I was very strong willed. I was very, um, like I say, I'm like a wild stallion. And I felt like I was just going to do what I wanted to do. And I didn't care. And it was so much, I used to say, it's so much injustices in this world. I can't live in this world straight, you know, and all of that. I was very, that, that was my mindset. It wasn't hopeful. It was very pessimistic and cynical. But whenever I surrendered, I, I finally was broken. I mean, I had gone through so much, as you see, mm -hmm. as long as it's breath in your body, there's still hope. Until that final straw, I was broken. I said, you know what? I can't do this. I can't live like this anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. Lord, help me. And I meant it. And I was willing at that point to do whatever it took. Did you think, though, after all you had been through, you had had like four psychotic breaks and you had been struggling and and doing any and everything imaginable. Did you could could you believe that this God that that you had known about and that your mother had prayed to? Did you believe that 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 God could heal you and could deliver you? Well, it, it's it's strange that you would ask that because I knew that God. I knew He had been God had been wooing me and drawing me. Since I was a, 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 a little girl, I remember uh, him. And I know now, I didn't know then, but I know that, that it was God. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so it was just like, it was so much other stuff going on in my life until I couldn't really connect with him and, and hear him clearly. So yes, yes, that, that thread of faith that, you know, because I accepted Christ as my personal savior at 17 uh, through my sister. She led me to Christ and and I just backslid mm -hmm. from there. I just backslid so completely. So, yes, I knew that God was real. Mm -hmm. And I knew that by the time I surrendered, uh, it, it was either that or, you know, it was nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like either either he can do it or. There's no hope. Right. He's and either he's either everything or he's nothing. Right. 
<laughs> and, you know, and that's why I'm so excited about hope, because I know that this is real. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is real stuff here. I mean, God is real and he can help anybody. Tell us about the work. Well, for me, the work was purpose. I, b- I believe that that's when uh, abundant life began for me. Because whenever you can connect with purpose, then that is what that's like the oxygen for everything else that I was able to do. And that happened to be uh, and that doesn't happen all the time. But for me, um, whenever I started working in the field and I started as a social worker and I started being confronted by this whole uh, crack cocaine epidemic and women who were going through situations that I had been through. And I started telling them my story and letting them know that recovery is possible and doing whatever I could to empower them, to empower them to become whole. Mm-hmm. I found my purpose. Mm-hmm. And Mothers in Crisis was, they were celebrating 30 years wow. this year. Yeah. You know what I, I wondered, you know, out of the things that you write in the book, I wondered at what point after you were delivered, were you able to forgive the actions of of that person that had kind of come into your body and taken over? Were you able to forgive that part of yourself? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you ask that because I'll never forget this. This, this happened to me uh, whenever I started moving towards uh, recovery and I was getting clean Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, and I went home to visit my mother who was uh, living in Pensacola. That was where I was. That was my hometown. And so she told me she's, you know, rare occasion because prior to that, because of everything I was doing, but she said, you know, I'm I'm proud of you. Mm -hmm. She said, but you know, uh, I was looking at, at a show. They were talking about how people, needed to forgive and learn how to forgive themselves. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, you're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and so I remember, you know, at that point, I didn't understand what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's a process uh, that, that just coming to that place of wholeness is a part of that, the journey uh, of hope to getting to that place where you just realize, you know what? Um, it happened, you know, when you know better, you do better. God has forgiven me and I forgive myself as well as others. Hmm. Wow. And you said that was a process that wasn't something that just happened. No, no, it was it, it, it didn't just happen because, um, sometimes you don't realize that you haven't forgiven yourself. You don't realize that that is a necessary process. I'm glad my mother said that to me because it it was always there kind of in the forefront of my mind because I understand about forgiving other people, Mm -hmm. but forgiving me, I need to forgive myself. That just hadn't dawned on me. Mm -hmm. And then, so you start doing the work and you start going into, to crack houses and into drug neighborhoods. When you start to see what other women were going through and that, that same thing that, that you went through, how was that healing for you? It was, it was, uh, it was very heartbreaking because for me, the, the call began when I uh, felt inside of me what the babies were going through and the, the children as they were growing up in, in, in those circumstances, as they were in the womb and having to, you know, ingest crack cocaine and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I remember having such a burden, but it didn't just, you know, it wasn't just the, 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 the babies because of what I'd gone through. It helped me to have empathy and to understand that I have to get through the mothers. I have to get with them. And, and then through that, process, we can help the children. And uh, so it was a burden. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, it was purpose. And so it was powerful. And when whenever God gave me uh, the, it's not just a cliche, 
But the phrase, as long as there's breath in your body, there's hope. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gave me something to to hold on to and to help me through the hard times whenever it looked like, you know, I wanted it more than they did mm -hmm. or they would never get clean. And so over the years, what we saw was that sometimes the mother and the father didn't get clean. But all those children, we held on to them. We started programs for the kids. And, and so many today uh, are doing well. And they come back and they, you know, thank us and they, you know, introduce mm -hmm. us to their families. And, and, and so, you know, that's what it's all about. It's about the, the, the unit as a whole. I always saw it as a family unit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was thinking as I was reading the book and, and that there's so many people right now that are hopeless people mm -hmm. who have either partners who are addicted or children who are addicted and don't see any hope because you, you said it and, and you, and you wrote it in the book where you would say, I just don't care. You know, I don't care about what others are saying. I don't care about what others think. And mm -hmm. if you know anything about addiction, that's one of the words that comes out. I don't care. How do you bring care to somebody who doesn't care? How do you bring hope to somebody who is hopeless? Well, it, it, it is a spiritual battle. And I believe it starts with prayer. Mm -hmm. And it starts with praying for the person. And then it starts with employing the three forces that shall remain. And that's faith, hope, and love. And so whenever you begin to reach out, you may not be the person, but you can help that person become a part of, uh, you know, find the resources, you know, whatever it's going to take. If you're willing to do that, then you can make a difference in that person's life. And it may not be you and it may not be then, but I'm telling you, you plant those seeds. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how God will bring that increase in a person's life because it's his desire that 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 we're all healed and whole and saved. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it may seem like an up, uphill bat, uh, bat may seem like it's an uphill climb. But I've seen so many people who everyone else had given up on and they are free and doing great today. To Tompkins, I know that so many people are afraid to have hope. And we were talking about it during the break. I know so many uh, moms that have young people that are drug addicted and mm -hmm. they've tried treatment and they've tried prayer and they've tried, you know, don't get me wrong. Prayer changes everything, but there is the person's will that is mm -hmm. involved and you can't impose your will on somebody's want. And so it, it, there's a lot going on. And, and I really want people to be able to grab hold and clasp hope. Mm -hmm. And so what do you say to those people? Hope is for the future. That's the thing that's so exciting about hope. Faith is for right now. Now faith is so the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you realize that hope is for the future, then it, it implies that there's going to be a period of waiting, that it's going to be, it's like, that's why I say faith, hope, and love. Hope is in the middle. Hope is in the hallway. So, so whenever you have hope, you understand that it, it may, you may not see it right away. It may not happen today. It may not even happen tomorrow, but I believe, and I know that things are going to get better. You're better than this. You're going to make it through. Don't give up. See, that's what hope does. It, it kind of lifts you and it, and it keeps you mm. uh, uh, as that, as an anchor, as the word says, so that you can keep doing what you need to do until you finally get it, until you make it, until you find the right uh, tools, the, the support, the, the, the treatment, the, the church, the whatever it's going to take. Because another thing about hope is that as it shines the light, it gives you an ability to see things differently. And you see solutions that you hadn't seen before. When you're hopeless, the only thing you see is just like a dark tunnel. And, you know, like it's, there's no way out. It's nothing we can do. But whenever you really start tapping into hope, then you say, well, you know, well, we haven't tried this. 
Well, okay. All right. Didn't work this time. Well, you know, let's do this. And, and you just never give up and you just keep moving mm -hmm. forward because hope keeps you moving forward as well. Wow. And I think, you know, coming from you, doc, Dr. Tompkins, it's so powerful because this is not just something pie in the sky. This is not something, just some rhetoric. You know, this is your life. You lived a life of addiction and, and so much happened. So you understand that there is light at the end mm -hmm. of the tunnel. And right now your, your focus for the last three decades has been on helping women Mm -hmm. who get caught up in addiction and who ultimately birth children in that addiction. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yes. And, and so many that are now grand, you know, grandparents like myself, I have three uh, and they are so precious. And I just think about, I'll be like, every time I, I interact with them, I just thank God because I'm, you know, it's, it's a miracle that, that, that was even able to happen. <clears throat> so, so now what, I, what I'm seeing is, is this, is that hope is so powerful and it's needed no matter what the circumstance. Yes, for addictions, but, but as you know, we've been going through COVID. We've been going through this pandemic for over a year now. Yes, there are signs, you know, the vaccinations and everything. But, but let me just tell you my latest episode of, of what I had to overcome. Okay. My husband and I, both tested positive for COVID wow. in, in January. And, you know, the first thing, the first thought is you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not some, you know, right. you know, sure. I'm human. Mm -hmm. But it's not the first thought. It's the second thought. It's, it's the second thought. And it's, and it's then applying all this that you've been talking about, applying this to this situation. And you know what helped me? And a good thing about hope is you begin to think about, well, I went through this and God brought me out. Mm -hmm. I went through addiction. So you think about what, what has he already done? What have I already overcome? Oh, I can overcome this COVID. Watching my husband, he, he really was sick with this and it, it just broke my heart. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of that, I never gave up hope because I really believed that everything was going to be all right. So this hope that we're talking about is, is not just about addictions and it's not just for back then, but it's for every situation. And that's what I'm so excited about. And you know what I was so excited about? And I love, I love the mantra, I'd rather hope because I would, <laughs> I would rather hope. And I, I think that we can make a decision about whether the cup is half empty or half full. And it's a yes. decision. And so yes. I think that talking about hope, and as you said, it the book is predicated on addiction, but hope is for every season, for every yes. purpose. And as a people, we have to find that hope because there is always hope, isn't there? There is. And, and studies show that people that are more hopeful, they have better quality of life, they live longer. They live well. So, so even if the circumstances may not change, you can change in the circumstance mm -hmm. and you can become more hopeful. And then you can watch and see, wow, you know what? I'm glad I was this way. I was glad. I'm glad I made the choice to think hope. Mm -hmm. Tell us before you've got to go about the poems of hope. That was, that was one of the gifts that I believe that God gave me uh, as as I came out of the hellhole of addiction and, and, and all that I went through, that he gave me the gift of poetry. And one of the things that I still do today is whenever something happens that's so deep that I, I don't even have words to talk about it, I'll write a poem about it. And uh, And so I believe that that those poems are ways to release this hopeful power as well. Mm -hmm. And so going forward, if there's just one thing that you want people to understand about hope, what would that be? That now we as a nation and also international this year, because uh, Pakistan celebrated for the first time ever, April is their national month of hope that we have a national month of hope, mm -hmm. that we have a holiday, a whole month 
that we can coalesce around being hopeful. And, and, and not only that, allowing that hope to be a part of our lives throughout the year and watching things change and watching situations change. I really believe in this public awareness campaign of hope because it's, I've seen it in my life and I've seen it in the lives of so many others. I'd rather hope to, before we've got to let you go, tell people how they can connect with your book. As long as there's breath in your body, there's still hope and all of the amazing things that you're doing. Please go to makeahopeconnection.com. That's our official website. You can also get the book on Amazon. Um, I also have an audible of it. I, I did. I recorded it in 2020, an audible version. So you can get that on Audible or Amazon. And uh, and all of the proceeds from as long as there's breath in your body, there is still hope goes to mothers in crisis. Mm. And, you know, as I was reading your book, I, I was talking to a friend. We were texting. And just as a side note, and I, I love what you said, that this book is not just about addiction. Um, she's fighting a battle of cancer, breast cancer. And, um, and, I, and I said to her, I'm reading this book. And we were just both very hopeful because as long as there is still breath, there's always mm -hmm. hope. And I think that that is just apropos for this season that we live in. We yeah. need hope for a better future, for a better day. And this book certainly speaks to that. And we thank you for your work. And we thank you for spending the time with our listeners and viewers to shed hope. 